In addition to everything in the present, a theory of everything must also unify past and future, from our beginnings in the Big Bang all the way to the ultimate fate of the universe. That is, a theory of everything explains not only the rules of matter and energy in the present, it will also explain the history of the universe from the beginning to the end. It will give the details of the primordial fireball and explosion of space-time and what it looked like as it expanded and cooled. It will describe the role that the known forces played and when they emerged from more fundamental forces. And we necessarily have a lot of ignorance for parts of this story. I mean, there's so much that we don't know. But we also know a lot, so I'll tell you the story both the bits that are well-grounded in known science and the bits that range a bit more deeply into the realm of the speculative. To start this story, let's first sketch out the basics. Using observations made by Edwin Hubble in 1929, we know that the universe is expanding, and thanks to astronomer Fred Hoyle, we now call it the Big Bang. According to the popular view of the theory, the universe was once concentrated into a point with zero volume, what scientists call a singularity, and it exploded. It's probably worth reminding you that singularities aren't real, and means that you've pushed a theory beyond the realm over which it applies. So this singularity shouldn't be taken extremely seriously. It's just a reasonable approximation, and we can use it, even though we know it's wrong in detail. Most people have a mental image of the Big Bang as a grenade exploding somehow. This image is wrong, as it implies that there's a center to the universe, and if you had some sort of super faster-than-light drive, that you could travel to the spot and stand on the location where the grenade went off, so to speak. However, this vision is very misleading. There are questions of what came before the Big Bang and what exists outside our universe. But in this lecture, I want to talk exclusively about our universe. To do that, I'd like to first sketch out the big ideas of our universe as it currently is, then talk about how we think the universe might have looked at the instant of creation, and then use the physics that we've learned thus far to unify the origin of our universe with the universe that we know today. So what do we know about the universe now? It was born in a primordial fireball about 14 billion years ago. If we look to the cosmos in any direction, we find that galaxies are generally moving away from us, and the farther away they are, the faster away they move. Galaxies within 10-ish million light years are moving toward us or with us, but galaxies far away are moving away from us with a certain velocity. Galaxies twice as far away are moving at double the velocity. Triple the distance, and you get triple the velocity, and, and so on. This recessional velocity doesn't depend on the direction you're looking. Look in that direction, and you get one relationship between distance and the velocity at which galaxies move away from us. And if you look in that direction, you see the same thing. And it's the same everywhere in the universe. It's not like a blast site where some locations are closer than others. Every place in the universe sees distant galaxies moving away in all directions. There's another bit of evidence that we must take into account. In 1964, American physicists Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson discovered a hiss in the radio wave spectrum that was identified to be nothing less than the signature of the fireball of the Big Bang. This might be a little hard to get your head around, especially if you're thinking of a fireball as a big, glowing, orangish kind of thing. But if you think about an explosion in slow motion, it starts out white hot, then as it expands, the temperature drops and the color turns yellow and then orange and then red, and finally it cools to the point where it can't be seen. However, there are parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that also can't be seen, in visible colors, if you will. In the same way, while the temperatures of the Big Bang were once unfathomably high, emitting gamma waves from sources far hotter than create visible light, the universe has since expanded and cooled. In fact, the temperature of the universe, the temperature of the Big Bang, has now cooled all the way down to 2.7 Kelvin, or 455 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And an object with that temperature will emit radio waves, which is what Penzias and Wilson observed. 
The wavelength of these radio waves is about 2 millimeters, which is on the short end of the radio spectrum, and overlaps with the microwave range. For this reason, this radio hiss is called the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB. There is one interesting feature of the CMB. It's very uniform. This uniformity is very puzzling, and for a very interesting reason. The CMB that we see coming from that direction was emitted essentially when the universe began, and it's now just getting to us. And the same is true for the CMB coming from that direction. And that's a bit of a mystery, because the light from one side of the universe hasn't made it to the other side. So in principle, the two sides of the universe were never in contact. The only way you'd expect to see that sort of uniformity was if all the points of the universe were once in the same place at the same time. Our best explanation for this is a rapid period of cosmic inflation shortly after the Big Bang. There is one more curiosity about the CMB. While it's very uniform, in 1998, scientists observed that it had tiny variations, about one part in 100,000. If you make a picture that accentuates the variation, you see that the sky is splotchy. This also needs an explanation, and we have an answer for that as well. And it might be the coolest explanation of all, as it ties together the smallest imaginable phenomena with something as big as the entire visible universe. The uniformity of the CMB is but one aspect of the universe that it's hard to explain without a theory of everything. There are two others that are quite perplexing. The first is the amazing uniformity in the distribution of matter throughout the universe. Now, I have to be careful here. I mean, we see tons of evidence that what I just said isn't true. Just look into space. There are places where there are planets and stars and places where there is, well, empty space. So even in our solar system, we don't see matter distributed uniformly. But if we look at a galaxy, things look a bit more uniform, although in the case of the Milky Way, there are spiral arms and gaps in between. Looking from even further distances, the idea of uniformity seems silly, again, as there are galaxies separated by huge distance of space. Looking at further distances still, we see that galaxies are located among huge ribbons and sheets, winding their way through space, separated by huge voids in which nearly nothing can be found except dark energy. However, when we look at the visible universe as a whole, taking in all of creation, we see that all of those smaller, clumpy structures are just small potatoes, and that the matter of the cosmos is amazingly smoothly distributed. That's just an extraordinary observation, and it really needs explaining. However, perhaps the most perplexing feature of the universe is why space itself has the shape it does. Even talking about the shape of space is hard for most people to get their heads around. For instance, space could be flat like a table. Space could be curved like the surface of a sphere or a donut. Space could be shaped like the surface of a horse saddle. Space could be undulating like sinusoidal waves, or it could be in any manner of distorted configurations. Remember that one of the consequences of Einstein's theory of general relativity is that space and time can be distorted. The mathematical possibilities are literally endless. But space isn't all of those possibilities. In fact, to the best of our ability to measure it, space is flat. Perfectly, mathematically, flat. We've been able to determine this by looking at those variations of temperatures in the cosmic microwave background radiation. We understand pretty much how they came to be, and we know how far away they are because we know how old the universe is. If space is distorted, it would distort the patterns we see in those hot spots. Yet when we look at them, they appear exactly as we would expect if space was perfectly flat on the largest scales. Yes, there are local deformations due to clusters of galaxies and local variations of matter. But when you ask the question of the overall structure of the universe, it's flat. And that's just weird. I mean, of all the possible configurations, flat is just one of them. Yet it's also somehow special. Why the special one? So those handful of things are puzzling. The uniform expansion of the universe, the uniformity of the remnants of the primordial fireball, the uniform distribution of matter in the universe, and finally, the flatness of space. These are all observations that we will have to explain with our theory of everything. So what do we know? 
Well, the short answer is that we don't know, but we have an idea that could bring it all together. This idea is called inflation. It was first published in 1980 by American physicist Alan Guth. The basic idea is simple, and it's just an extension of the usual idea of the Big Bang. In inflation theory, the universe began and it started to expand. Remember that the Big Bang isn't what happened at time equals zero, but it's everything after time equals zero. That's not central to what I'm talking about here, but I want to repeat it at every opportunity because the misconception is so deep in our culture. So the Big Bang began and the universe was expanding. That's not new. What's new is at the time early in the process, the universe began to expand exponentially. The details are not known, but the scientists believe that about 10 to the minus 34th seconds after the Big Bang is a reasonable starting point. Then for something like every 10 to the minus 34 seconds, the size of the universe doubled. And this process went on until just shy of 10 to the minus 32 seconds. So the total duration was very short, but in that period, there were 100 doubling periods. And two raised to the hundredth power is about 10 to the 30th power, which is an awfully big number. During that time, the universe expanded from a size far smaller than a proton to the size of a grapefruit or so. And with this one idea, Guth explained everything. So how did he do that? Well, to begin with, when the universe was super tiny, it was all in contact and thus was homogeneous. The expansion pulled matter apart from one another and the subsequent normal expansion of the Big Bang kept them apart, never to interact again. But the matter and energy was already imprinted with the initial homogeneity. So that explains the uniformity of the cosmic microwave background and the distribution of matter. Now, how inflation explains the flatness of space is even cooler. Suppose that before inflation that space was actually distorted, say it had the shape of a sphere. After inflation, no matter what shape it started out with, it would look flat. The easiest way to envision that is to think what happens if you could take a marble and scale it up to the size of the Earth. While the Earth is no doubt a sphere, you wouldn't know it standing on the plains of Kansas, where the planet seems flat for as far as the eye can see. In fact, no matter what the original shape of the universe was immediately after it began, inflation will always make it appear flat. There are some consequences of inflation theory that people find a little curious. For instance, you might ask just how fast the universe expanded if it went from essentially zero size to the size of a grapefruit in 10 to the minus 32 seconds. If we take the radius of a grapefruit to be 10 centimeters, that works out to a speed of 10 to the 31 meters per second, which is much higher than the speed of light, which is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. If you've been conditioned to think that nothing can travel faster than light, this might trouble you. However, the restriction on objects and the speed of light deals with objects traveling through space-time, not the expansion of space itself. In fact, in general relativity, there is no restriction on the expansion of space. So this seems like a problem, but it isn't. The second consequence is that it means that the universe is bigger than we can see. The universe began 13.7 billion years ago, and the most distant light from the earliest moments is just reaching us. However, the universe has been expanding while that light's been traveling, and the upshot is that the radius of the visible universe appears to be 13.7 billion light years, but at this moment, the diameter is actually about 90 billion light years. However, inflation suggests that the universe is much larger than that. So we need to be careful when we talk about the universe. There is the universe and the visible universe. While the visible universe has a size we know, the universe itself could well be infinite. So what could have caused inflation? Well, basically, you need an energy source. Now, don't think that the question is answered because it's not. But there's at least one idea that is interesting. It comes from the concept of a phase transition. A phase transition is like when water turns to ice. It's when matter or energy changes form somehow. And in the transition, energy is extracted. For instance, it won't surprise you that energy is coming out of water as it's cooled. However, energy is also coming out of water when it reaches zero degrees Celsius and begins to freeze. And the amount is surprising. As it happens, 
Just about as much energy comes out of water as it cools from the temperature needed to make tea to zero Celsius as comes out of the water during freezing. And phase transitions are not a metaphor. They're part of the theory. For instance, if there's a grand unified force that includes both the strong and electroweak forces, when that force turns into two separate forces, that's a phase transition. In fact, the energy that is released during this transition is one candidate for inflation. It's not the only candidate, but it certainly would be an incredibly elegant solution. It would combine both the unification at the smallest size scales with the very curious observed uniformity of the cosmos. Nice and economical explanations like that are exactly what we like to see in a successful theory of everything. Okay, so understanding the origins of our universe is a way to try to pull it all together, to connect quarks to the cosmos, so to speak. So what do we know? We know of the standard model and we know of general relativity. We know how matter acts when it's stationary and how it acts as it approaches the speed of light. We know how matter works under temperatures near absolute zero, nearly 460 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, and as high as four trillion degrees Celsius. We've explored the universe at size scales as small as about 10 to the minus 20 meters and to the size of the universe itself at 10 to the 27 meters. It's now possible to sketch out a timeline of the universe from beginning to the present. Using particle accelerators, we understand the rules of the universe to energies approaching 10 trillion electron volts, which we think corresponds to times after about 10 to the minus 13 seconds after the Big Bang. Now you should be very cautious here. Before about 10 to the minus 13 seconds after the Big Bang, we speculate. In fact, that earlier realm reflects times and energies for which we need better experiments and better theories. Those theories could invoke extra dimensions, supersymmetry, super strings, loop quantum gravity, or something else that nobody's imagined yet. Indeed, if we ever want to understand how the universe came into existence and got where it is today, we absolutely must figure out a theory of everything. And the arrow goes both ways figure out a theory of everything, and we'll know how we came to be. So, let's start out, as do all good stories, at the beginning. As I tell the tale, I will distinguish between what we know and what we imagine. I will further try to highlight points at which the differing theories we've learned about so far give us a different picture of how it all began. I will separate the history into different epochs, during which different physics play a dominant role. We begin in the Planck epoch, in, which is the period of time between zero and 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Even using the most traditional of theories, ones in which the standard model and general relativity are the final word in physics, we know that the very meaning of physics breaks down before the Planck time, which is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So prior to that time, we have absolutely no idea what's going on, nor is there any prospect of using what we've learned thus far to project into this era. Realistically, I think this might be an impenetrable barrier, but we don't understand the realm well enough to say anything definitively. However, using fairly traditional physics, things clear up a bit after 10 to the minus 43 seconds. After that time, the energy of interactions is about 10 to the 19th billion electron volts of energy, and the temperature is 10 to the 31 degrees Celsius. It's at this point in the history of the universe that gravity is thought to break off from the other known forces. This is the natural time of a theory of everything. It's the period of superstrings, if that happens to be the right idea. Or it's the period where loop quantum gravity comes into play. And if loop quantum gravity is real, that particular theory postulates an earlier universe before the Big Bang. The details of that early universe are extremely speculative, but the idea is an exciting prospect for those who have found the idea of a single creation event to be unsatisfying. If the idea of extra dimensions as an explanation for the weakness of gravity turns out to be right, then the times and energies I've mentioned here are not right. Ditto if, if inflation is real. Times and energies, again, would be different. The big idea of gravity splitting off from the other forces is probably right in any of these cases, but don't take any of the specific numbers too seriously. The Grand Unified Epoch exists from about 10 to the minus 43 seconds to about 10 to the minus 35 or 10 to the minus 34 seconds or so. 
During this period, the strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces were all unified into a single grand unified force. The nature of this force is not yet known. The temperatures at the end of this epoch were about 10 to the 26 degrees, and the characteristic energy was about 10 to the 15 billion electron volts. If inflation is a correct idea, it is the period from about 10 to the minus 34 to 10 to the minus 32 seconds, give or take, that inflation occurred. During this period, the universe was experiencing a hyperkinetic period of expansion which flattened space and forever erased any possible complexity of the earlier universe. In some respects, inflation is nearly as much of a barrier to understanding earlier times as the start of the universe itself. Of course, we're not certain that inflation really happened. If it didn't, then we'll need another explanation for the uniformity of the universe, which means that our understanding of this period is murky indeed. From the time period of about 10 to the minus 32 seconds until about 10 to the minus 12 seconds, we don't know the details of what's going on. At 10 to the minus 12 seconds, the characteristic energy is about 1,000 billion electron volts and the temperature is about 10 to the 15 degrees Celsius. This is the realm where we've taken data using particle accelerators and we therefore understand what's going on pretty well. You'll notice I didn't talk about supersymmetry and where it comes in. That's for a couple reasons. First, we don't know if supersymmetry is something that exists in our universe. The second is that, even if it does, until we've discovered it and found the energy at which supersymmetry is broken, we can't assign an energy and temperature for which it occurs. Similarly, even though we've discovered and confirmed all the antimatter particles, the observed asymmetry between matter and antimatter occurs somewhere in there. If no new physics exists between the realm where we're currently exploring and the grand unification scale, the energy regime from 100 billion to 10 to the 15 billion electron volts is called the desert, which simply means there's nothing new to be discovered for a very long time. It's kind of like explorers of space. They can zoom around the solar system encountering planets and asteroids. As they move into the outer solar system, things get harder and harder to discover as they're separated by bigger and bigger distance. However, once a spaceship breaks free of the world of planets and even the Oort cloud of comets, it encounters empty interstellar space. And there's an awful long distance between the outskirts of our solar system and the neighborhood of the next star. If the desert seems frustrating to you, imagine how frustrating it is to me. This is the realm where my colleagues and I labor, looking for dark matter and supersymmetry, leptoquarks and prions. As we dig through our data, we desperately hope that we'll encounter a surprise like the American Americas were to Columbus, or, keeping with the desert metaphor, we hope that we will at least find an oasis or two along the way. At a minimum, we'd like to rest at an oasis where the antimatter asymmetry is explained. As times get later and later, we understand far better what happened as the universe was born. That's a consequence of years and decades of research. At 10 to the minus 12 seconds, the electroweak force splits into the familiar weak and electromagnetic forces. The Higgs field has come into existence and subatomic particles of mass. The universe is very hot, so matter and antimatter particles are still appearing and disappearing. The universe is dominated by radiation as it's hot enough that the particles that existed at, at that time are constantly radiating energy. This is also the time period during which the universe was hot enough to allow quarks to exist without being bound up inside baryons and mesons. Indeed, quarks and gluons can run around willy-nilly in a state of affairs called a quark-gluon plasma. For this reason, we call this period the quark epoch. You could think of this as the time when protons and neutrons are melted, except that protons and neutrons had not been formed at all yet. Which brings us to the next epoch. At a time of about 10 to the minus 6 seconds, the universe had cooled some more. The characteristic energy was about a billion electron volts. This is the realm where quantum chromodynamics comes into play and starts binding quarks into protons and neutrons for the first time. At temperatures just above a trillion degrees centigrade, the last important building blocks of atoms came into existence, joining the electrons that we think existed from the very beginning. 
from the period of about 10 to the minus 6 seconds until 100 seconds after the universe began is what we might call the Hadron Era, in which quarks combined to form hadrons, both baryons and mesons. Protons, neutrons, electrons, photons, and neutrinos scurried around the universe as it expanded and cooled, as did other unstable baryons and mesons that scientists discovered in the 1950s. Time could be now measured in minutes, as about three minutes after the Big Bang, the characteristic energy was about a million electron volts and the temperature was about 10 trillion degrees. The universe had finally cooled enough so that protons and neutrons could combine and form the nuclei of light elements like deuterium and helium. Heavier elements like carbon and oxygen and the rest of the periodic table would have to wait until they could be forged in the furnaces of stars that were yet to be born. From the period of 3 minutes to 380,000 years after the universe began, it was too hot for atomic matter to form. But just shy of 400,000 years after our story started, the universe had cooled to about 3,000 degrees centigrade, and the energy had dropped to about a single electron volt. This allowed the first atoms to be formed. Finally, matter was cool enough that electrons and protons could combine to make hydrogen, and alpha particles and electrons could combine to make helium. This was the period at which the universe became transparent. With all of the electrons bound to atomic nuclei, the photons that had been keeping the universe hot suddenly didn't have anything to interact with, so they could march across the cosmos forever. This was the moment at which the cosmic microwave background radiation became visible, and when we see it today, we're seeing the universe like it existed 380,000 years after the universe began, although the light has been converted to microwaves by the expansion of the universe. And remember when we talked about the little variations in the CMB where it had spots that were hotter and colder? The current explanation for those spots is that when the universe just began, it was filled with quantum foam, which are short-lived and evanescent virtual particles. If the idea of inflation is true, then we can explain the spots. They are those little variations in energy density of the quantum foam, frozen in time and expanded by inflation to span the cosmos. And that is just about the coolest idea ever. The idea that phenomena so small that we'll never be able to image them directly can create structures that are hundreds of millions of light years across. There is no other example of the cosmic and the quantum so intertwined. After 380,000 years, the particle physics component of the universe muted and gravity took over. At this point, the currently visible universe is just shy of 100 million light years across. While expansion from the Big Bang continues, over the millions and indeed billions of years, gravity's inexorable tug pulls diffuse clouds of hydrogen into dense knots that eventually ignite with a fire of nuclear fusion. Stars form and burn and die in glorious explosions called supernovae, in which the seeds of planets and life are formed. Carl Sagan chose aptly when he said that we are all star stuff. It's important to remember that not only is ordinary matter coming together and clumping, but that undiscovered substance that we call dark matter is also swimming through the cosmos. Since we don't know what dark matter is, we can't speak of its creation and evolution. If dark matter is made of a simple wimp, then perhaps made from processes involving supersymmetry, it was probably formed in the desert between 10 to the minus 32 seconds when the grand unified force broke into the electroweak and strong forces, and 10 to the minus 12 seconds when the electroweak force split into the weak force and electromagnetism. But all bets are off if the idea of complex dark matter proves to be real. After all, we don't know the physics that will bind together dark matter. Dark electromagnetism, if it exists, is completely unknown. However, we do know of one more transition in the history of the universe, one that's continuing today. After the universe began and the Big Bang flung the matter of the universe across the cosmos, the expansion continued with gravity's inexorable tub ever slowing the expansion. That is, until a fateful day about five billion years ago. It might have been a Tuesday. Cosmologically speaking, just shortly before our own sun was formed, an energy field of constant density was beginning to become important. About 9 billion years after the universe began, this dark energy became the largest source of energy in the cosmos. And, as we've seen, dark energy is a repulsive form of gravity. 
the expansion of the universe was no longer slowing, it was accelerating. Now, it doesn't take much of a leap to see the parallels between dark energy and inflation. In both instances, the expansion of the universe accelerated. The two phenomena are different, of course. One occurred in far less than the blink of an eye, while the other is far slower. Inflation occurred in the confines of virtually no space, while the effects of dark energy depend on very large amounts of space. Further, it appears that dark energy has always been part of the cosmos, while the energy of inflation may have come from a one-time phase transition between the grand unified force and the strong and electroweak forces. So it's hard to generalize from one to the other. Going forward, we can predict what we'll see. If dark energy remains a constant energy field, it will continue to accelerate the expansion of the universe until distant galaxies that are now visible move so far away that the light that is emitted from them never arrives. Eventually, the universe will look very different, with only a few nearby galaxies visible and the remainder gone forever. Astronomers looking at the night sky from the vicinity of Earth would imagine a very different cosmos than the one we see now. It is in the stories that I've told you in this lecture that the need for a theory of everything becomes the most clear. For as long as there's been writing, mankind has wondered about such questions as where we came from and where we're going. And over the millennia, many ideas have been proposed. However, our understanding has been greatly quantified over the years, especially over the last few centuries, and we now know a great deal. But we want to know more. And it will take a theory of everything for us to be able to complete the cosmological story of where we came from. In our next lecture, I'll discuss questions of what came before the Big Bang and what exists outside our universe.